What's up, y'all? Stud Doogie here with Chapter 5 of my Dead Space 2 No Damage playthrough on Zealot Difficulty. Uh, chapter 5, we're going to begin down where the uh, the bodies get processed. Chapter 5 is kind of the you should have seen it coming chapter where this whole thing should be an indicator to us at this point that Dana is a unitologist, but we're just kind of unaware of it. And this is also a, uh, a perfect example of what I was talking about in a previous chapter where nothing happens, but the fact that nothing is happening is building tension because we know that something is going to happen, like something has to happen. And uh, in this area, we have these narrow corridors. We don't have a lot of space to work with. So the tension builds because we know at some point we're going to have to face some enemies and we're going to be in this narrow space with not a lot of room to work with. So it just builds and it builds. And every time, you know, I go through a door in my first couple of playthroughs, I'm expecting something to happen. So you see, I'm kind of moving at a pretty uh, decent cadence and clip uh, in this playthrough. But in the first playthrough, I was dragon ass i was slow as hell and when this dude first jumped out at me man i damn near had a heart attack <laughs> i damn near had a heart attack when he first jumped out at me so this is yeah this is just a really good example of where nothing happens as we open the door like four times and then on the fifth door we finally have an engagement so the, here's we're gonna have another engagement coming up now, I, I go right because there's a consistency for me for going right, and I rotate left. And the reason why I rotate left is if I go immediately through that door, he spawns later than he otherwise would do. So by going left, I get to speed up his spawn, which then speeds up the one that just attacked us, his spawn. So it's pretty predictable as long as you do the same thing uh, versus some of the other encounters where... It's, you know, it's, it's more random. This is more consistent as long as you repeat the same actions. I love this dude who thinks he's going to trick somebody. Just got his shit blown up. Yeah, he thought he was going get to away with, get away with it. it. The interesting thing about him, he's the only one with a blade. You know, his appendage is a blade. All the other frozen corpses that he's mixed in with have no blades. So he kind of, you know, outs himself in that regard. But, um... I didn't know he was there. He he popped up and surprised me the first time I played through. It's like multiple playthroughs, and I realized that he is uh, he's clearly identified because of his appendage being a blade. Okay, so let's talk about seeing it coming. So I suspect, or I expect, that everyone at this particular point has played through the game because of you know from my very first episode, I recommended you guys play the game yourselves before watching any content so you get the the best possible experience but as you're playing through in this point in the story we supposedly don't know that dana is a unitologist who's manipulating isaac for her own purposes and she has no real intention of helping him and the reason why we should have seen it coming is because she is the one that has given us the route that we're supposed to traverse to get uh, to get to her so she can supposedly help us. Which means she's the one that is guiding us through the belly of the Unitologist um, center slash church. How in the hell would she know how to guide us through the labyrinth that is the Unitology system if she herself wasn't a Unitologist, right? But we probably weren't aware of that. At least I wasn't putting those pieces together as I was playing through it. You know, because um, this game builds so much tension that you spend most of your energies preparing for the next thing that's going to try to jump out at you, at you and kill you. And you may not, like, put all the pieces together. So uh, this opportunity to do post-commentary and play through multiple times to do a no-damage run, you know, more of the pieces fit more coherently um, than it did in the story where... You know, you you didn't get the full depth of everything that's going on because your your current concern isn't the story; it's your own uh, staying alive. Yeah, you know, she's just she's, she's telling us to follow the route that she gave us in a hurry. So, 
again, with some hindsight, we can clearly see that we're being manipulated at least this stage in the game. It should be obvious at this particular point that we're being manipulated because we are navigating the bowels, the internals of this place. And really only a unitologist would have that kind of insight, right? Because we're even about to go through some, some vents here. And so that's, that's part of her, the path that she has provided us. So once again, indicating that she is not our friend, but we should have seen it coming, but we didn't. We were too busy trying to stay alive. So it's okay to spend all our nodes here because we're going to get another one before we leave this area. All right, let's get it started. So we're about to go into our happy place into the vents where we know we won't get attacked. Uh, I didn't show it, but if you look to the left, you'll see a dead body just kind of hanging in there. So maybe it's not so safe, or at least it wasn't safe for that individual. But we're all good. Man, when I was going through this for a couple of times, I'm going to shut up so you can hear the background. And the squeaking and the noise and the sounds. Yep, that shit was like, whew. Good. There was a lot of clenched buttholes in the playing of this game, let me tell you. You do not want to play this game with loose bowels. You might have an accident. Another thing you might notice is that my game is particularly dark. Um, and that's on purpose. I did not want to brighten it up. You know, the setting, the gamma setting in the game where it says to uh, do the control until the icon is barely visible. I took that to heart and I made sure it was barely visible. And so you see a lot of shadows, a lot of darkness, because like I said, I, I want to fully experience the terror that is this game. You know, because it's that, it's that good terror, that, that healthy terror where you face your fears in a safe environment. This motherfucker here. I don't know how that missed. I still don't, because I know I hit him, but whatever. Let it go. Let it go, Doogie. Woo saw. Woo freaking saw. All right, we're going to meet up with Dana, and we're going to meet maybe the ugliest character in all of gaming. Well, not, okay, not yet, not yet. I forgot about this part. So, yeah, this is also an interesting uh, fight. I, I like these, these kind of set-piece moments that this game has because it involves shooting, right? It's not like your traditional boss fight type situation where it's just like empty as money, much ammo as possible into an enemy before the enemy kills you. It's more like a quick time event, like you might find in a God of War or something like that. But instead of it being a quick time event, it's about hitting your target. So I like that about these kinds of engagement. Now, this is really where the Javelin shines as one of the best guns in the game. Look at that. Look at that. It's just, this is where it shines. This is where it's a beautiful thing. This makes it easy. We just... Put them in a kill box, right? Kind of trying to come through this doorway. It's a, basically a kill box. And uh, we just kill multiple enemies with just a few shots. It's a thing in beauty. Javelin, the bomb. This dude cracks me up. Check this out. It's like, I'm coming to hurt you. I'm going to fuck you up. And then, boom. <laughs> Got knocked to the back of the room like a scrub. <laughs> oh, you know what I mean? But the, the funny thing is, like, the first time he bum-rushed me, man, that shit caused some panic. You know, like, this dude's coming. And I didn't use the javelin in my first playthrough. I used the seeker rifle was my primary. And I was trying to hit crits. You know, hit the joints with the seeker rifle, which, because of the way they move, is rather difficult. Which is why the javelin feels so much easier to, to hit things with, to me, um, because I spent the first two playthroughs playing with the seeker rifle in the position of the javelin. Now, here's the benefit of knowing what's going to happen. Twofer! 
we got ourselves a twofer. I love twofers. And I really enjoy just kind of, you know, taking my time with this part of it. Because it's not all bum rush, bum rush, bum rush. They do try to bum rush you on some aspects with some jumps. We're about to get another one here. I miscalculated where he jumps from, but I adjusted and dealt with it. So it's not going to be that window. It's going to be the other one. And like an idiot, he's sitting there screaming at me instead of attacking. But, you know, I'm not going to play cause, complain because he just set himself up for failure. And this wouldn't be a no damage, a successful no damage run if that he had gotten away. If he was smart and instead of screaming at me, just mauling me. I don't know why I'm doing that. Oh, yeah, because I expect dude to climb up on this uh, this outcrop here. And I got impatient. I was like, screw it. Something shiny. So I went after the shiny thing. And he came up anyway. And so this is a nice, easy stroll. And doing some killing, you know? You don't have to try too hard, work too hard with this one. You know, the hardest part would have been the bum rush of the, the kids, the toddlers. Uh, but if you have the javelin or you have the um, the detonator, you're good to go because that does that great AOE damage. You could also use that the wide um, plasma cutter thing, the, like the giant version of the plasma cutter, because that passes that passes through multiple enemies simultaneously. Oh my God, she's so whiny. L just listen to her. She is so damn whiny. Now, uh, in a previous episode, I talked about the fact that nothing pops out of an elevator and jumps us. This is the moment that it happens. So you can imagine that first couple playthrough where every single elevator I'm going into, I'm expecting this thing to happen and it didn't happen. And this is the one that it finally freaking happened. Oh my God, my heart was in my throat. It was crazy. But, you know, this time we know it's coming, so we're ready. Two shots and he's dead. And stomp him for good measure. So this is about the end of the fighting. We're going to get into uh, an action scene here. I really, 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 really like this action scene. Primarily because of the sound design. I'm going to shut up when it happens. You can just listen to it. It's just, it sounds amazing when you go out in space and it gets really kind of quiet, but not. Um, and then we'll also talk about the fact how lucky Isaac really is. We, we, I mentioned that before when he was falling through the train, but this one is even crazier. Look at this dude on the left. The, he's got to be like the ugliest guy in gaming. Look at that face. Like his mama must have bitch slapped him when he was born. I, it's like it's not possible. Uh, we can talk over this. It's not really important. It's it's the sound design stuff that uh, that's really amazing. That's going to be coming up here pretty soon, and she's going to die a gruesome death. I really enjoyed her uh, her death. I don't like betrayal. I have I have a thing against betrayal, and you know she's basically betrayed his trust, and therefore she deserves to die. I don't know why they try to give her an ass. You see that? Like she's trying to rock a booty. <laughs> oh man. She's about to lose her hand. She died a gruesome death. Dude got his head shot the hell off. Now, here's another example of Isaac being super lucky. Everyone else getting shot up, but the the machine gunner just can't seem to hit Isaac. What are the chances? Lucky some bitch. Okay, so you hear all this noise. It's really, really loud. Okay, so, you know, here we are. We're, he's breathing a sigh of relief. It's all good. 
No, it's not. It's not good. <laughs> Dude, the sound on that scream is just so good. And I love these fights, these boss fights that are not really about just pumping as much ammo as possible. You know, it's more like a quick time event, but instead of doing quick time actions, you just got to hit your shots. I think that's pretty cool. Again, super lucky. Like, he should have broke his neck right there. He should have had a groin pull at least. Um, something. Listen to that music. That shit is real, man. That shit is lit. Run, Isaac. Run for your life. Okay, here we go. Yeah, that whole section, just amazing sound. From the time he hits the rig to about here. Now check this out. What are the chances, right? You get blown out in a freaking space and then you get blown back into the space station. Oh my God, Isaac, the luckiest motherfucker to ever live. Okay, so chapter six, uh, we need to say, but we can't go through that door until Ross has done his spiel. So I'm kind of just wandering around here waiting for um, this, this quasi cut scene to end. You know, I could have gone in and collected some of the resources. There's a node and there's stuff to get, but I'm going to do that in the next chapter. So we're coming in here to the end. Um, I want to thank you guys for watching and uh, I'm going to end the commentary here. I will catch you guys uh, in the next video.